Welcome back. All right. Where we were going with this here is we're, we were setting up an argument that we're, then we're going to try to take apart. That's called a straw man argument, okay? Uh, I'm posing this idea that a skeptic hypothetically could say, well, how can we make a forecast of the climate 100 years from now if we don't know what the weather is going to be doing three or four days from now? Why, well, I remember that time it rained when they said it wouldn't, blah, blah, blah. All of which is a valid concern. But what about this argument? Is it true that we can't really understand what the climate is doing based on climate models? I mean, if climate models are pretty much the same thing as the numerical weather prediction models, maybe the skeptic has a point here. Well, I'm going to tell you that the answer is, is no. The skeptic is wrong here. Basically, there's two problems with what the skeptic is saying that make up kind of the rest of this big lecture here. One type of problem is that the skeptic apparently doesn't understand that climate forecasting and weather forecasting are two very different types of questions. Okay? What we are actually asking is different when we are asking questions about weather than when we are asking questions about um, the climate. There's different types of questions. The nature of the equations that determine the weather and the nature of the equations that determine the climate are different. And we'll talk about that in great detail, but I just want to point out here too, the other kind of argument that will come later in this lecture is that the skeptic is, is, is this argument here about not being able to make forecasts and things like that shows that the skeptic doesn't understand that there's a difference when you're talking about questions of climate and questions of weather as to what constitutes an answer. What actually is an answer to a question about weather? What is an answer to a question about climate? What do we need to know about the climate of the future? What do we need to know about the weather of the future? And so on. This, of course, takes us back to one of the very first lectures we had that was about the differences between weather and climate and so on. All right, so let's start kind of picking this apart. What actually is, is wrong with the skeptic's idea that, well, apparently we can't make models of climate because we can't make models of weather. And how are we going to make these big long-range forecasts of the climate if we can't predict the weather? And I said one part of the story is that weather and climate are just very different kinds of questions. And I don't mean that in like a vague way. I mean like as in the underlying equations and how those equations get solved to determine something about the climate of the future or the weather of the next few days or whatever. I mean, it is true. Climate models and numerical weather prediction models, or NWP models, use pretty much the same equations and the same sorts of techniques in order to produce forecasts. Um, in some examples, they are literally the same thing, uh, where a, you know maybe a researcher at a university is literally using the same model for weather prediction applications over here and for climate prediction applications over here, although in general, in fairness, they usually are you know, actually different programs. But they basically work in the same way. They both start with some kind of initial conditions that are based on weather observations. So if you're going to be making a weather forecast, you get the current weather observations and you put them into the, uh, the model as input that is how you then you apply the seven primitive equations to start making forecasts. In fact, that's what the other steps here are. You use, step two is you, you apply the seven primitive equations to those initial conditions to get a forecast one time step into the future. And one time step in the future could be as little as like 15 seconds or something like that. And then you just apply the seven primitive equations over and over and over again until you get a forecast for some point into the future. And now, in the case of numerical weather prediction, these models will sit there on very large computers and run. It takes, you know, on the order of hours for them to make a forecast for a few days into the future. Because, I mean, they're applying all these equations at millions of grid points in the domain, uh, at all those different levels and so on, many, many thousands of time steps to get a forecast maybe 48 hours into the future or 72 hours into the future or whatever. Whereas for a climate simulation, you're going to put this up onto a supercomputer and let it run for literally weeks, maybe even months, so that it can compute these calculations of the seven primitive equations at millions of grid points at all these levels, every time step, but not for a few, you know, to simulate the next few hours, but for like the next 100 years or 250 years or something like that. It can take literally months on a supercomputer for these models to run. Well, they do sound awfully similar. I mean, there are some behind-the-scenes differences and strategies and stuff like that, but by and large, these do sound awfully alike. So why is Dr. Shragi telling me that it's actually okay that sometimes these forecasts go bust when we're talking about, like, weather prediction, but apparently we're supposed to have some faith in these climate models? It, I, it sounds so far like that, cli that climate skeptic isn't so far off. I'm not sure I... I uh, have convinced anybody yet, right? Well, let's think about this here. Let's try to understand why forecasts go bust. What's wrong that we can't make these forecasts 
well, sometimes they go terribly wrong even like a day or so out into the future, and they certainly always go wrong after a while. I mean, we run the models out to maybe five days or ten days, but we can't actually use the forecast that far in advance. The model doesn't mean anything. It, it, it's too far from what the real world is doing. If we're going to understand why some forecasts go bust, there's going to be two kinds of problems here. One set of problems is going to be associated with those initial conditions. Remember, these are going to be based on the observations. Now, in the first module of the course or whenever it was that we talked about, or I think it was the second module, where we talked about observations. I showed you pictures of weather stations at the surface and buoys and things like that. In the case of modeling, actually, the key is, is weather balloons. Weather balloons are launched all around the country at about 100 locations around the country every 12 hours, and we launch these balloons, and the balloons carry instruments up into the atmosphere with, that measure things like temperature and pressure and winds and so on, and, when, and they radio that information back down to the ground so that we have observations, in situ observations, from the atmosphere up, up, up in, you know, away from the surface. And if everything goes right, really good information gets collected and ends up being used to produce the initial conditions that get fed as input into the numerical weather prediction models. Oh, but so many things can go wrong. Um, I mean, nominally everything works and we get lots of really good observations, but you know, you launch these balloons and balloons pop. Okay? You launch the balloon, it flies halfway up as high as you need it to go and the dumb thing pops and it falls to the ground. Yeah, you didn't get your observations. Wait 12 hours and you'll launch another weather balloon. All right, the balloons pop. The instruments on board those weather balloons, you can kind of see the little package of instruments hanging below the balloon in this picture here. Those instruments sometimes fail, like maybe they literally stop working, the battery fails. Sometimes they're just out of calibration. They were There's a manufacturing defect or something like that. And, you know, even if the instruments are working, they only measure the temperature and the pressure and the winds so accurately. I mean, we only measure temperature to like the, uh, on a weather balloon to like the nearest degree, but, you know, the real temperature isn't, let's say, 33 Fahrenheit, it's really 32.6. I mean, that four-tenths of a degree might make a difference, all right? Um, you know, we only measure the wind speed to like a few, within a few percent of the right answer. Um, if, if we only are measuring these things so well, there's only so well these observations are going to work out. But the bigger problem actually has to do with the fact that we don't actually launch that many weather balloons. Um, on the map that shows here, I actually have labeled the roughly 100 places around the country where we actually launch a weather balloon. Um, the nearest one is KOAX, which is a weather station just west of Omaha in Valley, Nebraska. And they launch weather balloons at each of these stations about twice a day. Uh, and that's really not enough. I mean, he, look how far apart these stations are. These weather stations where they launch these balloons are, you know, they average about three or 400 miles apart. Plenty of weather features just happen between those feet, those two. If there's an important line of thunderstorms where that star is right now, well, that, that star is no closer than maybe 200 miles from Grand Junction and Salt Lake City and uh, that's outside of uh, Las Vegas and so on. I can't think of the name of that station. Um... We didn't even see it. The weather balloons didn't even know that there was a line of thunderstorms out there. There's no way the model's going to know that that line of thunderstorm is out there because the observations don't show it, even though it's real. Worse, we only launch these balloons once every 12 hours. They're expensive. We don't launch them, you know, it'd be nice if we could take them every hour or something like that. But plenty of important weather features that end up affecting the weather of a location start after a weather balloon launch and end before the next one. We never even took an observation of it. Well, how is that going to end up in the initial conditions? It won't. So will the model's understanding of the initial conditions include that weather feature? No. And that is a very, very serious problem. So try as we might, there's just no way to have perfect initial conditions for your, as input to your numerical weather prediction model. The numerical weather prediction models, their forecasts are perfect. They're perfect in the sense that, like, this forecast is exactly what would happen if those initial conditions were exactly right. The problem is... They're not exactly right. Um, this is a real problem because we don't even necessarily know all the ways they're wrong. I mean, we don't know. Once the balloon floats away with its instruments, we don't even know how far out of calibration those instruments are. We don't have any idea if, like, when a balloon pops and falls, they all pop eventually. Uh, was something important that was affecting the weather just above that and we didn't get to see it because the balloon popped and fell? Um, did we just miss a weather feature that was a little bit farther east, but we launched the balloon here instead of over here. We don't even have a way of knowing. 
And this is a major problem for numerical weather prediction. I mean, let me just work, walk you through an example here. Suppose you took the current weather observations all around the country and you used them as initial conditions and you ran a numerical weather prediction to make a 48-hour forecast. Okay, a very standard thing to do. Okay, now if you just took those same initial conditions, so that was like one, ex one model that you ran here. Now take those same initial conditions but maybe make a little change. Like, for example, um, uh, take one of the weather balloons that was launched and have it have, pretend it popped you know, when it was only a few hundred meters above the ground, okay? So you don't actually have very many observations at all the different heights above, say, Omaha, okay? So the weather balloon over Omaha, just delete all the data after 100 feet above the ground or something like that, okay? Use that as your initial conditions for the model run. Run your model out for 48 hours, and you know what? Sometimes it makes no difference at all. Sometimes it turns out the two model runs will end up being almost exactly the same. They'll end up, regardless of whether or not that observation from Omaha was in there or not, you actually end up with pretty much the same weather patterns moving the pretty much the same way over the next 48 hours. It doesn't change anything. Great. On the other hand, sometimes things go to hell. Sometimes the forecast is completely different when you make a change like that. And all of a sudden, just based on the fact that the balloon popped in Omaha, our forecast changed completely. The balloon popping didn't change the weather. The balloon popping changed the information that was input to the model, and now the model has a different idea about how weather patterns are going to evolve. Well, why did one weather station's balloon change the forecast so much? Oh, well, this is the real big complexity that is known as the butterfly effect. Okay, I hate that term, the butterfly effect, but it's something that like pop culture has sort of latched onto. Uh, you've undoubtedly heard this idea of a butterfly effect. If you Google it or something like that, you know what I'm talking about, where like people say, oh, if a butterfly flaps its wings in China, it moves a hurricane in the Atlantic. Okay, that is not really what the butterfly effect is, but it is this idea that small changes that you aren't really in control of sometimes do end up making a big difference. Now, a butterfly flapping its wings, is that, that, there's lots of reasons why that's not right, but the basic idea that small changes you're not in control of, like I don't have good observations here, or um, my, my uh, thermometer on this weather balloon was out of calibration and these observations are not correct, actually change your model quite a bit. This term butterfly effect, it's cute that people have tied it to this idea of a, of a butterfly flapping its wings. That's actually not where this term comes from or anything like that. It actually comes from this graph. Uh, Ed Lorenz was a uh, atmospheric scientist, oh, I don't know, in the 40s or 50s or something like that, who discovered some of the mathematics behind this sensitivity to initial conditions. And the graph that he produced showing it is uh, what you see right there. Um, it kind of makes a shape of two sets of circles around each other that sort of overlap, and he called it a butterfly diagram. That's actually where the uh, term comes from. It actually has nothing, I mean, Ed Lorenz knew that butterflies flapping their wings don't move hurricanes, okay? That's just sort of a pop culture idea. But the basic idea here is sound. I mean, for weather prediction, we have a problem here, and it's not a problem that's very easy to overcome. We know the physics of the atmosphere really, really well. The seven equations that are coded up in, the, in these numerical weather prediction models, they're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. We have studied, we know the f application of Newton's second law and the first law of thermodynamics and the continuity equation and all those equations that we showed you in a previous lecture. We know those really, really well. And they're all in those models and the model is computing all those factors just fine. But realistically, we need unobtainably good, nay, unob unobtainably perfect uh, initial condition data if we want to have input for this model. Otherwise, sooner or later, the forecast is useless. The forecast busts. Sometimes it happens really fast because of some bad observation or some missing observation. It turns out your forecast actually had very little to do with how the model was really... Your fo forecast didn't simulate what the real atmosphere was doing very well. Sometimes it takes on the order of a few days before things start... where small differences in your initial conditions compared to the real world add up to now the model doesn't look very much like what the real atmosphere is doing, but eventually the forecast always becomes useless. Now, let's think about what we're doing here. Just to reiterate, we were saying that the skeptic hypothetically had some kind of argument. It said, how could a scientist claim to model future climate 100 years from now if we couldn't make a simulation of the atmosphere like three days out from now? Okay. Uh, we can't actually make a forecast of whether or not, you know, when will it rain or how much are we going to get a couple days in advance? How in the world do we know what the global climate is going to be like 100 years from now? 
And I said, well, part of the story is the fact that weather and climate are just very different kinds of questions. Part of the answer has to do with the fact that numerical weather prediction is an example of, um, of, a num of an initial condition problem. The initial conditions are what determine what a numerical weather, weather prediction is going to say the forecast is going to be like in coming days. Okay, but initial conditions are not the only input into a numerical model. We're going to see that there's a second type of input to a numerical model. Yes, we have to know the initial conditions at it, but there's one other one as well, and that's going to be the difference between how we model weather and how we model, model climate. But before we do that, let's take a little break and ask two more questions real quick. Um, I like to bust up the lecture. I don't think it's a good idea to have students staring at a YouTube window there for you know an hour straight or something. Um, question three, true or false, like numerical weather prediction models, Climate models are based on the seven primitive equations. Now oh, that shouldn't be too hard. True or false on that one. All right, follow the one of the two links below and get some feedback before we move on to question four.